Good morning, we're in Hong Kong. We're on the top of the IFC Mall and I'm here to interview Daniel Hagos, who is the MD for MRCIS in Greater China and Southeast Asia. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Napoleon. So you're from London, I, I am believe. From London, yes. uh, what brought you to Hong Kong originally? Um, so the short version, um, I plan to go traveling. Actually, so I plan to go traveling for a year. Uh, and then about three weeks before I was due to leave, my boss, or the boss in Hong Kong, asked me if I wanted to move out here to set up a new team called Client Success across Asia Pacific. So I said, okay, you know, why not? It took me about half an hour to decide, actually. Um, so I traveled for a few months, then I moved to Hong Kong. Uh, the plan I had originally was 18 months. That's what I told my mom and friends. Um, and then it just yeah, carried on. It's been five years now. Tell me a little bit more about what you do at MRSIS. MRSIS is a marketing technology company. Um, I've been at the company since 2011, so in London and then here. Um, the focus of the company has always been around um, creating a more personalized and relevant marketing experience for consumers. Um, so it's expanded from being like basic email marketing, personalized emails, data-driven campaigns, marketing automation, and now sort of omni-channel personalization. And I've, I've seen, you know, I've been involved in digital marketing here for God knows how long, 20 years. MRSIS in the beginning was one of the companies that came here and really tried to educate the, the kind of markets and what digital is, how you yeah. use it. Where do you feel we are now in, in 2020 in terms of Hong Kong and digital marketing and the, the kind of acceptance and understanding of how to use it? Because this is traditionally quite a traditional kind of market in the way that people go out and reach out and, and engage their customers. Do you see a lot of change? It's interesting. Um, there's different types of businesses. So I think that there's a lot of businesses in Hong Kong which have been very used to working in a certain way and how their marketing um, strategy has been delivered and haven't perhaps been the quickest to adopt new and emerging technologies. Um, I think that what's interesting in Hong Kong is that um, customer loyalty to brands is quite strong. So in a way, actually, luxury brands seem to be doing really well in Hong Kong because of prestige. And, and it's interesting because for us, we analyze all of their customer data and you can see that the loyalty for these brands is really, really strong. Um, and all of the marketing campaigns, all of the strategies are around that customer loyalty. So in a way, if you're a large brand like a Lane Crawford, for example, they have a huge amount of customer loyalty. Um, What's interesting is so, so all of their marketing strategies are tailored around that. Um, there's also a lot of other businesses like cosmetics where it's very much um, personalized. It's WhatsApp, it's um, individual communications between beauty advisors and, um, and consumers. So in a way, it's not really centralized digital marketing. It's almost a, this is our digital marketing strategy. There's individual people executing it. I think what's interesting in Hong Kong is there's still this big question mark around is WeChat relevant in Hong Kong? Um, no one's really been able to, obviously in China it is, but in Hong Kong it kind of is, it kind of isn't. Uh, email marketing is still strong. But generally I would say, there's a, I think there's a lot of excitement around Hong Kong. I feel like different brands are trying to do different things and, and it's not just this, okay, let's just focus entirely on WeChat. There's companies are trying to do a little bit of everything. They're focusing on Facebook, Instagram, they're still doing traditional marketing, they're still offline marketing as well. So it's quite broad. I'm quite surprised exciting. actually that um, email is still, you know, has yeah, yeah, such yeah. a hold, right? Yeah. I mean, I know it's because of mobile phones like the one I'm holding now, yeah. but uh, that's kind of given it a second life. Mm. But, uh, you know, I'm really surprised. And then you're working, you said Greater China and Southeast Asia. Mm. So are you seeing, I'd be curious to see, are you seeing different levels or speeds of adoption? I mean, now in Hong Kong, you know, around the world, actually people look at China and go, oh my God, they're ahead of us in, mm. in anything mobile. Yeah. So maybe you could kind of explain some of the, because you're dealing with a lot of clients that are marketing across multiple channels, across yeah. multiple countries. Do you see anything particularly different or distinct uh, between these mm. markets? I think that regardless of the market, there is still the objective of saying, how can I understand who my consumers are, whether they be online across whichever channels and offline in store and creating that central single customer view. So regardless of the industry or actually the market that we go into, we're always saying, how can we get the right data on your customers? I was never really a big fan of saying things like big data, yeah. actually it's saying what data is relevant for, uh, for you to understand your consumers better and then saying, what is it that you actually want to be able to identify from your consumer? So is it purchase behavior? Is it how many articles they've read on your website? What are the touch points that you want to be able to track? 
and then saying which are the most relevant channels and how can you actually make it very tailored to those channels as well. So I think the, the first few parts, so the first part at least, is agnostic. Regardless of the industry you're in, what data is relevant for your consumers and what do you need to understand about them. Um, then the last part is saying, depending on the market, what should the channel that you use be and what should the messaging that you use be? Because there are certain things that, for example, email in China doesn't really work. Well, a lot of people perceive that. We found that in some industries it works better than others. Uh, if you are using WeChat, how should a message be tailored to WeChat? If you're sending campaigns in Japan, how should the content be slightly different? So you've been talking a bit about uh, trends here in Hong Kong. I'm curious to see, you know, with the uptake of e-commerce across Southeast Asia, yeah. uh, how is that, how do you see that people's habits changing and then therefore affecting the digital marketers and how they look at things? So I think if I give my own perspective, when I first moved to Hong Kong, I thought e-commerce would be perhaps stronger here than it is, but offline retail here is strong and it's so easy. To, you can, I see you can go shopping, shops stay open really late. So actually in different markets, the ease of shopping impacts the necessity for, um, for e-commerce. So in Hong Kong, e-commerce perhaps isn't as strong because offline retail is so easy to access. Singapore somewhat in the middle. If you look at markets like Indonesia, trying to go shopping in Jakarta is a nightmare. It takes three hours to get anywhere. So, you know, the mobile shopping, online shopping has grown so quickly there because there was the need for it. So actually, in a way, it's kind of, it goes hand in hand. E-commerce is directly reflective of how easy it is to shop yeah. offline. Um, in markets like Indonesia, it's difficult to get around. That's why I think e-commerce and mobile commerce has grown as quickly as it has done. And how do you think the, the kind of the situation in Hong Kong has affected that? Because obviously, you know, Hong Kong is a very versatile city. Now that we're shopping is becoming a little bit more difficult, or was, hopefully yeah. go back to how it was before. Yeah. How do you see that in terms of people's adoption of digital channels? So interestingly, we talk to a lot of our clients that are very focused on offline retail about the need to be online and to have online presence. Um, it's not a criticism, although it is, but I think people were quite reliant on offline. Offline was working well, everybody was making a lot of money. There wasn't the big need to invest in online. We're seeing that a lot of our clients are saying, actually, we need to invest in online. Um, and actually, if they had that omni-channel approach, um, they wouldn't have been so reliant on offline retail, actually. And especially with what's been going on in Hong Kong, um, it could have perhaps balanced things out for them and for their consumers as well. Good, so we've got time left for the two plugs. What's your okay. first plug? What's the first thing you want to promote? Um, the first one I've, I've touched on, actually, which is around, um, I think, the need to, to invest in online. I think having an, a strong online presence and a strong offline presence just means that actually you can do relevant marketing communications. So I'd say um, any company, whether you're a retailer, whether you're um, a hospitality company, should really be trying to do both because it's, I think it's what consumers are expecting. They're expecting to have a cohesive experience. Then you can do good and, and relevant marketing campaigns. Cool, and the second plug, what's that? Sustainability um, and in particular B Corp certification. And it's a certification process whereby um, there's an analysis or a quiz that's done around certain processes that you do in your company. Um, it's a good, for me going through the process previously, it allows you to analyze the processes that you're doing um, and you know how wasteful are you, are you using too much single-use plastic, things like that, the habits you have in the office. Um, I think it's, it's a good thing for a company to go through. So I'd say for organizations to own sustainability, I think it's going, it's going to be really, really interesting. Very cool. Thank you, Daniel.